What's going on guys? It's K-Dub here with another episode of Crypto Zombie. So today is Thursday. Thank you so much for joining me once again for another episode. And guys, thank you so much for everyone that's been liking, subscribing, and commenting. You guys freaking rule. You're the reason that I do this every single day, even on days like today when we have a little bit of red, but it's not really that bad. Consider you know, considering what we've seen. So $108 billion market cap, Bitcoin still sitting around $3,400, XRP 30 cents, Ethereum 90 bucks. And yeah, so this is pretty much the little, the little red that you're looking at. It's just this little blip right here. So moving on, talking about some other things, if we see what the biggest gainers of the day is, oh, we have Denticoin up 33%, our good old buddy Denticoin, followed by Credo, Dex, Waves, Qtum, Hypercash, Polymath, Komodo, and 10X. Now, Getting back to this chart, a lot of people are asking, are we going to dip below 3,000? Are we going to go all the way down to 1,500? Well, I have some information that might surprise you guys, and it seems like a lot of people are thinking we may not actually physically be able to break that $3,000 barrier, and if we do go lower, we may have an instant rebound to the upside. Now, we're going to get into that in just a minute. However, before we do, I want to ask you a question. Have you ever been up late at night just randomly searching for stuff? I mean, I remember when I first got into crypto, it was just like block folio, 3 a.m. in the morning, refreshing, you know, listening to YouTube videos in the middle of the night so I could catch a pump or something like that, right? Well, it actually turns out that according to the latest data from Google Trends, the search term, what is Bitcoin, is actually topping the charts for the what is category in both the UK and the US. And to make things even more interesting on top of that, how to buy Ripple is the fourth most searched phrase in the how-to category in the US. So it seems like people are starting to get interested in Bitcoin again. I've noticed this. I don't know if it's XRP, crypto, Bitcoin, Ethereum, or what's drawing the crowd in right now, but people are getting interested. As you can see, massive interest in South Africa and in the US alone, Hawaii is leading the way, California, Washington, New York, and Nevada, all in the top five. However, the one thing that I want to point out, now this is from the Blockchain Transparency Institute. They recently recently released a report and this is for November, okay? So basically what this is, is it shows you crypto exchanges by total daily users. This is interesting and I'm, and I'm gonna tell you why in a second. So Coinbase led the world in November with an average of 422,000 daily active users, followed by Binance, 313,000, and then there were a few others, but it turns out that there were only four exchanges in total that actually have over 100,000 daily active users. That's really not that much in the grand scheme of things when you consider the massive potential of this space. The other interesting thing is that Coinbase's visitors transaction volume is roughly only 10% of the other exchanges. So Coinbase is what most people especially in the U.S., are using as their fiat on-ramp and their fiat off-ramp, right? So the interesting thing is the average transaction volume per users on Binance is roughly 2,137, Bitfinex 3,518, but Coinbase is only 189. This is very interesting. So what is this saying to me? Well, if the markets are going down, but people aren't really cashing in and out, well, then where is that money going? Are people just staying pegged to stable coins right now, just kind of hanging out. So it kind of makes me think that even though the low visitor count for many of the world's top crypto exchanges is an example of how the drop in prices is putting stress on the crypto industry as a whole, at the same time, it seems like there's still a lot of us hodling and staying in. So the question is, what the heck is going on? You know, why are, why are we still going lower? Well, I wanted to talk about this gigantic buy wall. Okay, so according to Suzu, the CEO at Three Arrows Capital, buy walls on fiat to crypto exchanges like Coinbase and Bitstamp for Bitcoin at $3,300 have risen significantly within the last several weeks. Rising buy walls on major digital asset trading platforms suggest that small groups of investors are possibly beginning to accumulate Bitcoin while it remains highly volatile in a tight but low range. So Zoo explained 10% down from here, which would be $3,300 buy walls on Coinbase are now the largest in Bitcoin since around, you know, the mid 2015 time back on Bitfinex or excuse me, Bitstamp. So this is really interesting. 
Now, he further emphasized that to break below the $3,300 level, more investors on Know Your Customer or KYC enabled exchanges, which are essentially fiat to crypto trading platforms, will need to get through the large buy walls at around $3,300. Now, I'm actually going to show you how I've gone in and verified this as well, by the way. You can too. Anyone can. So he says that to break lower, it will require filling these fiat backed bids. So either one, more Bitcoin borrow to come online or two KYC able off ramp selling. So derivative selling will just lead to funding becoming very negative as it has been. So if a large unforeseen sell off is to happen, the daily volume of Bitcoin that hovers at around 4 billion would have to spike above its monthly high at just over 6.5 billion. So the decline in Bitcoin mainly shows that the sell pressure on Bitcoin pretty much has dropped. Now, what does this mean? Does this mean that, you know, we're just going to bounce right back up? Well, no, not exactly. So there's also this cryptocurrency analyst. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce it. I think it's Hsaka or Hasaka. So basically, um, this person says until Bitcoin breaks out of the major resistance, it's likely to stay in the range between 3,300 and 3,500. Several resistance exist in north of 3,000 at around 3,500 and 3,700. Now, this is just what the experts are saying, but I've actually looked around myself to verify. Now, if we come over to Binance right here, you know, and we scroll down to some of these lower ones. Now, obviously right now, of course, I'm trying to show you an example and they're not there, but you can see as we go lower, you're seeing massive buy walls here at around 10 Bitcoin, 20 Bitcoin. Now I took a snapshot this morning. I don't know if they went lower. I wish I could go lower on here, but I don't know how to, unfortunately, I'm not even signed in, but this is a screenshot I took earlier and you could see down here exactly at the 3,300 mark, 151 Bitcoin, 3,250, you have 158. And then at 30, 3200 you have another uh, buy for 172 bitcoin and this is on Binance, which as you saw was the second highest in daily active users. So, you know, if we add these together, that's 500, uh, yeah, so it's 500,000, 500,000, 500,000. Okay. So you're basically looking at $1.5 million worth of money looking to accumulate. That's massive. That is absolutely massive. So somebody with a lot of money seems to think, that, you know, 3,300, 3,230, and 3,200 are the sweet spots. Now, obviously, this is only $1.5 million. However, let's just realize what those, uh, you know, what that type of volume can do, you know, in the market. Now, granted, these are just single buy orders, so you're not going to really get that slippage. But obviously, these guys aren't going to be putting in that kind of money you know, and having it go much, much lower than that. So that's pretty much what I wanted to point out. Now, we also have Mark Yusko. He's the CEO of Morgan Creek Capital Management. Now, he's been talking a lot recently. In fact, they just made the $1 million bet that Bitcoin would outperform the S&P 500 over the next decade, right? Obviously, they said if they won, they'll donate to charity. They're doing the right thing. But the point of me bringing this up is that they are saying that Bitcoin is going to outperform all of these and they are encouraging all investors to hedge. Now, now, as you know, you know, there's smart money and there's dumb money. Well, smart money, whether or not they believe in Bitcoin or not, are going to most likely hedge due to the fact that traditional stocks are continuing to plummet day after day after day. So people that know how to diversify, obviously, that's what they're going to be looking towards. You can also watch the video right here if you haven't seen it. He goes, there's actually some other pretty cool nuggets in there as well if you guys are interested. I also want to just remind you how small the Bitcoin market cap is right now. I mean, literally, look at this right now. And, and obviously, these are probably a lot lower now. This is probably an older graph due to the fact that, you know, we've obviously had those sell-offs. But there still is that really steep learning curve. And that's something I wanted to bring up. So many people are still confused. They don't know what's going on. You know, I remember there was a time when I was literally, and I'm not exaggerating, reading between two to three white papers a day. And I started to realize after a while, they get very repetitive. In fact, most of them tend to just basically re-explain Bitcoin, put a small twist on it, and then call it revolutionary, right? And you do see that there's a lot of these buzzwords that go around. So they talk about transactions per second, market, you know, capitalization and stuff like that. But the thing is, when it comes to people arguing about, uh, you know, cryptocurrencies being able to scale, it's not really that big of a deal when it comes to it. I mean, everyone's like, why do we like my question is, why do we have to get the underlying 
assets to actually have the ability to scale themselves. I mean, first of all, if you want to do look at a graphic right here, I mean, here's an example of transactions per second. Now, this is an older um, uh, image, okay? So this is when it was called Rayblox. So this essentially, this green right here is Nano. Then you could see XRP. Okay, so Nano is doing 7,000 plus, XRP is doing 1,500, then you have Litecoin at 50, E15, Dash 10, and Bitcoin 7. So obviously, people are saying that even at this 1,500 or, or the 7,000, that's still not enough compared to Visa or MasterCard, correct? Well, if you really look at it, you know, I had this discussion with Mark Moss. Visa and MasterCard are second layer solutions, right? You have your money in the bank. It's not like every time I'm like paying for something at a grocery store, I'm running to my bank, taking out the cash and giving it to them. No, it's basically just, um, you know, an IOU. You swipe your card, they go, hey, you know, K-Dub, he's got the money in his bank account. Yeah, you're covered. It's not like the merchant gets the money instantaneously, right? I mean, look at gold. Gold is a you know, multi-trillion dollar market, right? And you're not seeing people physically moving gold. No, what do they do? They issue them cards, right? Guys that have a lot of gold, they have a gold card and they use that card to swipe and then that will take care of spending their gold and then it's all taken care of in the background in reserves, right? So I really don't think that we need Bitcoin to scale personally. You know, when you have things like Lightning Network and you also have these great tools like XRP and Nano as well. So that's just one thing. The other thing I wanted to talk about too is, you know, people confusing market cap and, and, and a lot of new people getting into projects, speculating based on cheap prices and not really understanding it. Because don't forget, a lot of these, uh, you know, like if you go to coin market cap, they're not really comparing it to the total. They're comparing it to the circulating supply. So that means if there's a relatively low circulating supply in comparison to the amount that's actually out there, well, you could potentially get dumped on, right? And this is something that I had brought up as well. I mean, even speaking on, you know, scaling, SegWit, look what that did. So I actually spoke about this, how to analyze cryptocurrencies, market cap, etc. cetera. Uh, this is an article I put out in the blockchain brief newsletter, but this particular article is actually completely free. So if you guys want to just have a look at it, I'll drop the link below. You don't have to buy the, the, the newsletter. You can totally get this for free. But I just want you guys to understand a little bit if you're new in the space how a lot of these buzzwords and things that people say, they're, they're not really as important as you know they try to make it out to be. And that's just the lesson that you learn when you really look through you know three white papers a day, right? Now, one thing I know that everybody loves is Bitcoin price predictions, right? And I don't think we've done a good price prediction in two days on this channel. So what are the experts the experts saying? Well, Verdict actually asked a few different people in the space what they thought Bitcoin was going to do. Now, the first is Samuel Leach. He's the CEO of Yieldcoin, and he's calling for a $10,000 to $15,000 Bitcoin in a year. Why? Well, he talks about similarly, the crypto exchange Eris X recently raised $27.5 million from Fidelity Investments and NASDAQ and is also planning to launch a crypto derivatives in the half of 2019. He speaks about Fidelity coming in, obviously NASDAQ as well. We have backed. So the involvement of such significant financial institutions and mature crypto trading products will lead to an appreciation in Bitcoin's price. The second price prediction comes from Joel Kruger, uh, currency strategist at LMAX. Now he's a little bit more realistic about it. Okay, He says our 2019 outlook for Bitcoin is far more constructive than what we had been projecting for 2018. As 2017 came to a close, we had warned Bitcoin had rocketed past the point of rational appreciation. I think we can pretty much all agree with that. And then it got highlight he highlighted just massive downside risks in a bubbling market with far too many holes. You have regulation, development, hard forks. Okay, I mean, come on, the Bitcoin cash thing did did definitely, I don't think, help the situation, um, you know, regardless of the fundamentals. And then also he says that we could see a continuation of weakness in the first half over the year before the market finally stabilizes. So we'll look for Bitcoin only to trade around $5,000 to $8,000 next year. So that's a little bit more conservative. You also have Kevin... Uh, Merco, CEO of Coin Metro, saying that despite Bitcoin's fairly limited use cases, and even though its technology may be less sophisticated when compared to some other projects, it will likely continue to remain the market leader in 2019. Bitcoin still has the reputation and the liquidity that make it preferable to other cryptos. It's difficult to put my finger on price. However, he does believe that it will continue to rise. We also have Mitch Blakeway, 
um, head of trading at Quantitex. They say that they believe Bitcoin will eventually shrug off the recent weakness during 2019, and they're expecting highs of around 20K, which would match our previous all-time high. Although, if you do look at the historical charts, once Bitcoin tends to kind of touch the all-time high, it usually really soars past it. So we'll have to see. You know, they say that they're pretty positive about the ETF being adopted and also the the continued adoption of cryptocurrencies such as uh, you know, Ripple or XRP by banking institutions during 2019, which is going to help to kind of alleviate some of that constant being pegged to Bitcoin all the time. You know, Bitcoin takes 5% hit, the whole market takes a 5% hit. You know, it's it's kind of getting ridiculous. You know, you don't see this happening in 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 um, you know, traditional stocks. It's not like if Netflix takes a hit, by default, Facebook and Amazon are going to take a hit too, right? So that is an issue. And we are seeing a lot of XRP exchanges springing up. Uh, We'll get into that a little bit later. So, you know, they do talk about during the dot-com boom, the price of Apple shares went from $1 to $4 before collapsing all the way down to $1. So that's a 75% fall. We've actually seen more than that in crypto, which is pretty crazy. And then finally, we have George Ermakov, head of research and development at Cryptarium, saying, based on the existence of important fundamental factors, such as the launch of backed ICE and NASDAQ futures, 2019 is expected to be very positive, and Bitcoin is likely to reach a price of around $12,000. So I hope that satisfies your insatiable urge for cryptocurrency and Bitcoin price predictions. Uh, yep, there's a lot of those. I'm just kidding, guys. They're always fun, but check this out. So before we get into the, the, the coin news and other news of the day, I wanted to point out that password management and crypto custody company Dashlane yesterday announced the third edition of its annual worst password offenders list is including cryptocurrency. And cryptocurrency investors are sitting at number three on the list. Oh my goodness. So cryptocurrency investors are the third worst when it comes to passwords. Guys, change your passwords, okay? Always put on two-factor authentication. And it also says that according to Dashlane, the number of passwords that the average internet user has to manage currently sits at around 200. That's crazy. Really? 200? Do do you have 200 passwords? I'm just curious because I don't. I might have like 30? 35? I don't know about 200. They say that this could possibly double by 2023 up to 400. So be safe out there, guys. Two-factor authentication and make sure you call up your phone company and tell them that you want to make some kind of a password or something so that, you know, you don't get SIM card hacked because we've seen that happening as well. So always be safe, guys. Now, Let's talk about this. So we found out that it was kind of a flop. They kind of screwed up. We weren't going to have KFC in Venezuela accepting Dash payments. But instead, we did get Church's Chicken. That's right, guys. An international fast food franchise has reportedly partnered with Dash Venezuela to become the first fast food franchise to accept cryptocurrencies. And... We have an official release here, okay? This is an official release, okay? So according to a press release, a strategic alliance between Dash Venezuela and Church's Chicken Venezuela will see 13 establishments start accepting the privacy-centric cryptocurrency as payment. Now, it's interesting, though. I do want to note that these guys are the fourth largest um, chicken fast food uh, chain in the world. They have 1,700 restaurants world, ro- worldwide in 25 different com- um, countries, but you know, I don't know if they're going to start accept- accepting it worldwide, but they are going to be doing it in Venezuela. Venezuela. So, and if you guys don't know the severity of the situation, I know we talk about this and I just want to like actually show you, this is a child. They're literally dumping piles of, of money. This is, this is in Venezuela, literally. I mean, he's using it as a ladder to climb up to the back of the truck to like help his, you know, family member out and, and continue to dump the rest of the money. So Bitcoin fell, you know, 80 something percent. How about this? How about this, guys? I mean, it's like it's like playing in leaves over here. It's like it's like fall time for the kid. So anyway, I wanted to talk about Razer. So they put out this tweet, right? And they say, "Have a gaming rig on idle at home? Here's a new way to score Razer silver. Launch Razer Soft Miner on your PC and start racking up silver. One step closer to the reward you want for doing absolutely nothing at all." Well. I had a look into this. Um, So you come over to the Razer page. So is Razer Silver a cryptocurrency? Well, it says Razer Silver is not a cryptocurrency. It's a loyalty rewards program. We work with crypto mining technology to harness your computer's GPU. In turn, we award you with silver, giving you access to Razer's ecosystem and uh, awards. So if it's not a cryptocurrency, 
but you're using my computer's GPU. I think the real question is, is Razer secretly using your GPU to mine something else in the background? Maybe like Bitcoin, Litecoin, or Ethereum, and then just giving you these silver tokens in kind of place? I don't know. Don't hold me to it. Sounds kind of fishy though. Scrolling down, I also wanted to highlight the fact that Razer Silver uh, awarded in Razer Softminer will have a 12 month validity period starting from the date earned. Well, if we go back over to the Twitter post, we see some people have had their opinions on this. Seriously, is this just an April Fool's joke? So just to confirm, running this at full power every single day, all it takes is 560 days to earn a Razer keyboard, um, which I guess is something that they sort of, did they advertise that? Oh yeah, so you can you can get a Razer keyboard. Well, they're saying that considering that it um it, you know it only goes on for twelve months, you wouldn't actually be able to accumulate enough rewards to um yeah I don't know guys have a look into this. It kind of seems like it's gonna be just a big old flop. So anyway, guys, moving on to coin news. I know you guys want to hear about some. I got a lot of news today, guys. Lots of stuff today. So U.S. brokerage giant TD Ameritrade is exploring whether it should bring XRP and other cryptocurrencies to its 11 million retail investors in response to a quick question about whether it will give its clients the option to trade XRP. The firm's live broadcast financial network said it is working hard to make things like this happen. And I just want to note, this isn't the first time that TD Ameritrade has revealed its interest in cryptocurrency. In October, the firm invested in ErisX, a new regulated cryptocurrency exchange for spot and futures trading, which we literally just spoke about. Now, talking about some other news of the day. Um, oh, wait, hold on. Oh, yeah, I also wanted to let you guys know that they have 11 million clients and 1.2 trillion in access. And they said that the retail clients are seeking to access and trade digital currencies. So they're so they're asking for this. I just want to throw that in as well. So talking about more of what's been happening with XRP, you recently had Joseph Young coming out with a tweet and he said that Coinbase has been listing everything in crypto apart from XRP, which is kind of strange considering it's the number two cryptocurrency. It says it may add every asset above a certain level like the stock market, but still no XRP. On a serious note, it's likely the pending federal court case against Ripple is holding them back for now, to which CZ actually kind of stood up up for it and said the court case may take years, but if XRP is ruled as a security, it would seriously hurt a lot of US investors and to a certain extent other users around the world too. It certainly doesn't look like a security to me, but that's just one person's opinion. So that can be said, you know, obviously if you're using it for uh, transaction settlements, that's uh, pretty much the definition of a utility to me. So, you know, but the, you know, the powers that be, they'll have to be the ones to decide. Now I also wanted to, you know, for the XRP army out there, I know you guys are pumped. Ripple's actually gearing up for an Ask Me Anything with CEO Brad Garling House, and that's going to be happening Tuesday, December 18th at 10.30 a.m. Uh, PST. So set your set your alarms if that's something that you want to get interested in. Um, you could submit your questions by responding to this tweet. So um, you just go just go there. If not, I'll drop it below. Um, another thing, too, is that Ripple CTO David Swartz uh, talked about the tech powering Ripple's cross-border payment solutions and their advantages over fiat and the company's overall strategy. If you guys want, you can play that video down here. And moving on to some other news really quick, we have Circle's Invest app has recently added support for Bitcoin SV, also resumed Bitcoin Cash BCH, and Stellar is about to be listed on Canadian-based crypto exchange CoinField. It's going to be paired with X. XRP and available to buy using a number of fiat uh, currencies as well. So some other coin news, if you want to talk about everything that's going on with Ethereum, so you have a new GitHub update that shows that Ethereum's biggest software client, Go Ethereum, is now on board and ready to implement the Constantinople hard fork. So this is set to happen sometime, hopefully around January 16th, and it's designed to integrate a number of improvements, including a boost to Ethereum's overall network efficiency and restructuring of the platform's uh, you know, minor rewards policy. Also, finally, we have IOTA Foundation. Foundation is launching two new development teams called Alpha and Omega. Alpha will work on improving IOTA's existing ecosystem, while Omega will focus on making sure IOTA's long-term goals are accomplished. Now, talking about some other cryptos that are in the top space, we do have Cardano. 
Charles Hoskinson. Now, I did briefly mention the updates yesterday. I realized I didn't go into a lot of detail, so let me just re-clarify super fast, okay? So Plutus is gonna provide a general purpose programming language and tools for the Cardano protocol. There's really not much else I can go into about that, but some people were asking a little bit about Marlowe. So this application provides instant global fund transfers for business, and it also enables the holding of rental deposits in escrow to increase transparency. I was going to go through this uh, this example here, but it's actually a little confusing. So basically, in a nutshell, if money is paid for an item, okay, item A, and let's say it's 450 ADA, and it must be committed by party one before block 10, well, it will be refunded if there is no consensus before block 90. If you're still confused, I give up. Just go just go check out some Cardano updates. So also we have Bancor, okay, 18 months live, and they have this really cool infographic if you want to come over here. They made it really nice. They talk about their achievements, their partnerships, everything that they've accomplished. It's really nice set out, really easy on the eyes if you guys want to have a look. We also have Quant Network, so they have joined uh, Interopen. I think that's how you say it, to accelerate the development of open standards for interoperability in the UK health and social care sector. So what is Interopen? Well, basically, the health and social care sector is notorious for holding vital information on different systems that cannot communicate with one another, negatively impacting patient care and user experience. In fact, just talk to my dad. You know, he hates when he has to go to different doctors and, and transfer this stuff back and forth. Um, oh, by the way, guys, the reason that I didn't uh, get back to all the comments yesterday, my dad actually just got out of the hospital. He had a um, he had surgery on his shoulder. He's fine. But yeah, that's why I wasn't around for the second half of the day yesterday. But anyway, getting back to it. So Quant Network is going to collaborate on the design and application of technical interoperability standards covering areas such as data exchange, data validation, defining APIs and governments. And this is going to be using the Quant Network's blockchain operating system Overledger, which is a pretty exciting thing if you haven't had a, had a chance to look at it yet. Now... Moving on to some quick news, and then we got to skedaddle on out of here. We have a United States federal court has ordered two exec executives from the crypto firm Arise Bank to pay nearly $2.7 million in fines. Now, we did speak about this. The CEO, Jared Rice, was arrested by the FBI November 28th on charges of defrauding hundreds of investors over $4 million. He allegedly falsified. Uh, falsely claimed that the bank could offer customers FDIC insured accounts and traditional banking services, including Visa brand credit and debit cards, in addition to cryptocurrency services. So saying that we offer cryptocurrency debit cards, but not actually having a partnership with them. Now, where have we heard this before? You guys just aren't learning your lesson, are you? Another one. But it's not just these ICOs even. We have stable coins feeling the pressure and the heat as well. So you have Basis, the stable coin project, is saying that they're basically shutting down and looking to return funds to their investors. This was $133 million in funding that it raised in a private round back in April. So, uh, and they had some pretty major investors too, one of them being... Uh, uh, Andreessen Horowitz. Um, now, to comment on this, we do have Nevin Freeman. He's the co-founder and CEO over at Reserve uh, Stablecoin Project, Reserve Protocol, which is crazy because we actually did an interview with them. It was the last episode ever of Token Tank, and we just never released it. So I still have the episode. If you guys want me to release it, I can. I don't I don't know how everyone else would feel about it. It's been like over a month and a half now, but I could. But anyway, he goes on to say that with other algorithmic stablecoins, Basis Protocol implements two tokens, okay? Now, the problem is that in many of these cases, these secondary share or bond tokens are actually considered securities under U.S. laws, implying that regulatory headwinds allegedly behind Basis's decision to shut down come mostly from the SEC in the U.S., probably, okay? Okay, so since there's only a small set of people who can legally buy these shares or bonds of unregistered security tokens, protocols based on this mechanism may be at risk. So that's basically what we're seeing over there, guys. We also have Spend. You know, I like to talk about adoption. So they've announced today that it's introdu um, introducing a payment. Uh, the payment industry's newest all-in-one alternative banking wallet application for users of Bitcoin, crypto, and fiat currencies. Effective immediately, customers in Canada and the U.S. may sign up for Spend Wallet and order 
order a spend visa card. And finally, we have Opera announcing that it has a public release of its Web3 ready Android web browser, which notably sports a built-in cryptocurrency wallet. So previously available in beta, uh, you have the ability to hold ERC20s as well as ERC721 collectibles as well. So yeah, I guess the whole idea is they're just trying to make it more user-friendly, make it less confusing and easier for the average user to get on board. Now, the question is, do you hold your private keys? Most likely not. Something to keep in mind, but for the newbie, for the person just getting in, for your grandma or your uncle or, you know, the skeptic, this might be a better solution for them moving forward. But hey, if that doesn't make you happy, guys, good news. Kimchi so uh, Socks has actually found some extra pairs of Doge and Bitcoin and they might be giving some away for free. So check that out if you're interested, guys. Want to remind you again before we go? Look at where we are. Look at these other guys. Just keep that mentally, okay? And also, I always like to go back to Charlie Lee because he, you know, you love to hate the fact that the guy just tells it how it is. You know, he sold at the top, all right? And he also said, you know, quite some time ago, he goes, I bought my first Bitcoin at $30, watched it tumble down to $2 in the next year. If you can't stomach 90% drops in crypto, don't adopt early. And he finally says, I didn't panic at two because the fundamentals didn't change. I even bought more coins cheap. I also didn't complain about it to Satoshi. So that about wraps up the video for today, guys. I know we went on a little bit long today. We had a lot of news, a lot of coin news today in the center. So it is Thursday, one day closer to the weekend. And also before we go, I just want to friendly remind you guys that there are seven days left. We have 906 uh, entries for the uh, cold lar wallet. Um, if I give it a quick refresh, let's see if we, oh, we have, we have a couple more entries. We had a few more entries since last. So yeah, guys, seven days left. If you want to get this guy's blockchain brief, if you haven't checked it out, definitely have a look, you know, we're giving away two of those wallets. We gave away three Trezors and, um, yeah, that was last month. So always fun time. Thank you for joining. Thank you for coming back. Everyone that's been liking, subscribing, commenting, you guys freaking rock. You're the reason I do this every single day. You know, I freaking love you guys. So once again, thank you. My name's K-Dub. This is Crypto Zombie. Until next time, stay crypto and peace out.